So thank you all for joining us today. So today we're hosting our Chem Talent EDI webinar. Um, I want to thank all of our guests here today. Um, you're going to introduce yourself shortly. Um, so what we're doing with this webinar is we're following on from an initiative that we've been doing within Chem Talent, um, where we've been looking at EDI within the chemical industry. As a group, we've spoken at length with industry leaders about where we think there's some stumbling blocks and some hurdles, um, and we've we've tried to give industry the chance to to talk to us and ask us questions about EDI. Um, but one thing we want to do now is to have a kind of a public webinar and, and discuss um, just what EDI is and and how we can better implement it in the workforce and how we can kind of underpin the values of why EDI is important. Um, so I think without further ado, the best thing to do is to introduce um, our panel members. So I'm going to go across my screen. Um, and uh, Viv, if you wouldn't mind going first. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Viv Dennis. I'm the HR manager in uh, a company called Stepan in uh, Manchester. I've been at Stepan for the last five years. However, I do have history with other chemical companies during my career. Um, synonymously in the chemical industry, we are an aging workforce. We have that as an issue uh, from what I see and from what we discuss as an employment network, as part of the CIA employment network group. Um, so that's what I'm here to, to talk about, EDI training, ageing workforce, those sorts of subjects. I hope that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Izzy. Hi everyone, so I'm Izzy Sloan and I am a chemical engineering degree apprentice from GSK. Uh, so I currently work at Barnard Castle and I am the new young ambassador for Chem Talent. So I'm just here to give kind of our generation's perspective on ED&I. Brilliant. Christopher. Hello everybody, my name is Christopher Bannister-Bailey and I am the group d &I manager at Croda. Um, I'm a chemistry graduate. I graduated from Manchester University in 2005 and I came into the chemical industry as a graduate into Crowder. I've been with Crowder for 17 years and recently moved into the DNI role um, because I believe my purpose within our company is to help forge a culture that helps all types of people succeed and have successful careers, whoever they are, um, feeling valued and respected. So, really passionate and looking forward to our discussion today. Perfect. And finally, Emrys. Hello, I'm Emrys. I'm the Disability and Accessibility Specialist within the Inclusion and Diversity Team at the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, <clears throat> so the team as a whole um, really works to, to make the chemical sciences, um, well, more inclusive and more diverse, uh, to kind of, you know, enable the access to the industry and to the and career progression for everyone, regardless of, of difference. Um, and so my role is focusing on disability, uh, which is a lot more broader than um, than some people tend to think it is. We'll come to that later, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, so just making the chemical sciences a more kind of welcoming and accessible place for disabled chemists. Brilliant. Brilliant. Sounds great. No, it sounds. Uh, I'm very excited to to jump into this panel discussion. Um, I think we've got a great panel, so I'm uh, very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your views and uh, and learning from all of you. Um, I think we'll just jump straight in, really. Um, and the, the first question that that we had is um, about EDNI strategy and about whether organisations and and companies should have EDNI strategies. Um, specific EDI strategies, I mean, and kind of instead of, you know, having company values or, or something like that. Um, but but if, if you think that they should, um, what do you think that they should look like? Um, Christopher, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay, being an EDI coordinator. Of course. Um, so I think it's really important to acknowledge the diversity and inclusion as a topic has been around for quite a while. And corporations, businesses of all sizes have been really thinking about what it means to be inclusive over, I suppose, the last 20 to 30 years. What that means for different companies is, is an individual and kind of personal aspect, I suppose, to what it, 
they can do as an organization, depending on the problems that they face when it comes to inclusion. For Croda, we don't have a specific ED&I strategy. We have a framework to build inclusion and to increase different uh, representation levels from different minority and oppressed groups. But really, we like to think about it in terms of our culture and having an inclusive culture means embedding inclusive behaviors into our leadership and our everyday. So that works for us, that helps us move forward. But for other companies, it might be thinking about really driving forward their um, goals and metrics by having a specific tailored diversity and inclusion and equity strategy that really helps move forward. So I think it's the discussion really is about how do we how do we in the chemical industry or in the science um, industry in general think about what it means to be inclusive and what our barriers are as companies and therefore what do we need to do to overcome them by putting goals in place? Emmys, do you want to follow up? Yeah, so within the, the Royal Society of Chemistry, I think we actually have um, sort of all sides covered, I think. So we um, we do have an inclusion and diversity strategy to 2025, which um, sort of focuses on uh, on the external work again. So we're not sort of thinking about internal to the RSE as an employer, but about our kind of work to externally to make the community of the chemical sciences more inclusive. Um, so we have that strategy that kind of guides our work as a team. We also have the Royal Society of Chemistry's overall strategy where inclusion and diversity is a really key pillar. And I think that's really important, right, is whether or not you have a particular strategy, and that might be very dependent on, you know, the size of your organisation, for example. Um, the important thing is that it's not seen as something that is separate and that is, uh, you know, distinct from the general working of, you know, the, the core strategy. Um, but I think what has also been really helpful for us um, in terms of benchmarking our own activities is the um, progression framework, diversity inclusion progression framework that was developed by the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Science Council. Um, and so I think throughout the organisation we've been sort of using that as a means of benchmarking and measuring and seeing where progress needs to be made. So that's that's been really helpful as well. Viv? Yeah, um, pretty much like Christopher really, um, not really got an EDI strategy. Uh, we're a small site within the UK, we're a global business. A lot of what we do are driv is driven by the US, which comes with its own particular laws as well. Um, so we incorporate that at a local, a more local level. Um, and obviously we were part of Europe, so it's, it's a bit difficult when you're a small site on your own to then develop that framework that, that then relies on the rest of the business to buy in when they're all at different points in law and in, in discriminatory law even. Um, our biggest challenges of a workforce of 125, not like a lot of you guys, where Coder especially, massive company, um, our biggest challenges are unconscious bias, actually, is one of the ones I would say. Um, we, are, we are white male, again, quite synonymous in a lot of um, chemical companies, from what I can see. Um, it's that recruiting the same and, and, and removing that unconscious bias approach um, with some of our leaders in the organisation. We have really good values at Stepan, and I know, obviously, we were touching on a bit about aside from the values, but our values are, are at the bottom of everything that we do really and they're at the core of everything um, that we do in terms of performance management right across to the way we behave from a leadership and an individual perspective. So inclusion always gets um, a, a part of the five-year plan for the business, it always gets mentioned, uh, developing inclusive workforce and, and development is, is for all. Um, it's just the challenge is getting away from that unconscious bias approach. And I've just recently done some uh, bite-sized um, session around equality, diversity, inclusion with plant operators. So you can imagine how fun that was. 
um, giving talking about you know banter in the workplace down to what what does it mean to have to for pronouns you know with a with a person who's uh, approaching 60 who's never heard of the word they them he her you know is starting to see that how do you develop that, that that's probably some of the problems we've had is teaching those people at that level and that age and I can see Christopher nodding so obviously in, in agreement there <laughs> I don't know what does anybody else think yeah sure I can jump in actually I think I think this is where you know if we think about the question should should organizations have strategies actually a lot of the groundwork if you're rooting it in what it means to be a, a, a good inclusive company comes back to some of those conversations around what training and development do you have available to your staff to help employees and colleagues work together so unconscious bias training is definitely something that um, i recognize that is, is a useful tool but it's it's broader than that you know you've got generational differences in, in what is perceived as unacceptable or, or has commonality and um, how an organization sets up a psychological, psychologically safe organization to enable those conversations to happen in a positive way is, is, is fundamental to this. So again, that, that broad kind of idea about having an ED&I strategy, actually, if, it, if it's something separate, as Emerys was saying before, you're no, you know that that's probably not going to take you all of the way because re representation absolutely matters in increasing um, the number of uh, ethnic minorities in, in the workplace, of LGBTQ plus people in the workplace, of people with disabilities in the workplace is super important. But if your organisation isn't rooting itself in, in value-driven behaviours that enable all people to succeed, your strategy is probably not going to help you retain a group of people that may feel um, discriminated against or, or, um, or just not happy in the workplace. So it, absolutely companies should have them, but what does it look like? Well, it gets complex when you're having to think about it integrating into a HR L&D strategy or into a HR culture strategy, into business division strategy on ensuring that we're, uh, your products are targeting a range of people and they're not just focused on one area. What Viv was saying before, your recruitment strategy, where do you pull new talent from? Is it the same area? What barriers do you have in place? Um, so, and it can feel exhausting, it can feel like overwhelming. The, what I would say to everybody watching is the most important thing here is the idea be behind the ED&I strategy is, is, is just ensuring that everybody can have a good career and, and work and do good work without feeling uh, negatively about the company or the people that uh, you're surrounded by. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> um, Izzy, have you got any points to add? Yeah, just I think that's absolutely right. I think it needs to come from all angles and it needs to come before people are even employed into a company. So you know how you wouldn't, you'd build an office and then you put the people in it. You need to kind of build that culture and build that strategy and whatever needs to come with it to ensure that you can get that diverse diverse workforce. And then I think everything after that will kind of fall into place. It's I think I can see when I'm at work, you can see different people have different values and the culture definitely needs more of a change and more of a shift to be able to do that pre-work before people get into the companies. But yeah, I think it is all about coming it from different angles. And if the strategy works and that's part of that, then brilliant. But if we can find different ways to contribute to that, then that's great. So I think... Um something that you've you've all touched upon um is about how you know the edni policy it's about embedding that culture and it's about everyone being represented um now i don't know what your experience is like but but something that i've seen is that and i don't know viv going back to your point whether it's because of just the the demographic of our industry is generally kind of all the white men but when we talk about edni policy we kind of it seems to be kind of 
assume that it's just a gender balancing policy and it's kind of i think because we have those discussions you know we miss out on that lgtb side on that disability side um and i'm not saying groups get underrepresented because people just assume ed and i is you know it's about how do we get more women in the workplace um but i just want to know what, you, what your thoughts on that are and how can we ensure that everyone is represented when we do talk about ed and i and it's not just about you know gender balance in the workforce which is an important thing you know don't get me wrong but it's making sure everyone's represented um viv i'm gonna bring you in that first okay um i think it's about um helping people encourage encourage their point of view and recognize what they can bring to the to the job really you've got different perspectives from all different backgrounds what I will say is disability may be well represented because a lot of the workforce being in a particular generational situation will may have developed disabilities over time and therefore not recognise that they have a disability, but you are accommodating them in the workplace. So we forget that part of it as well as much as somebody coming in as a new employee with a disability. We've got existing employees with disabilities that we quite willingly accommodate so i guess in part part way we are in, inclusive of that group really but we just don't think about it in that respect i guess um for me for instance uh, i'm an enterprise advisor at a local high school as well um, so i go in and promote careers within our industry um, to our local high school and because I'm, I'm linked up with this particular high school, we do things like workplace safaris and bring children and um, students onto site, uh, showing them uh, different jobs, different roles and how they can all apply for these roles in the future. Trying to help the chemical industry in, in, that, in that context, really, um, which has been really useful because it's then I've had um, some of our colleagues who, are, who have a recognised disability, for instance, present to those children to say well I came from this background and you know you can do it too so it's that sense of belonging from early early really I guess um, but overall it's about recognizing difference and uh, what differences they can bring maybe to address what recognize uh, what customers not want they might bring that to the table as well okay yeah yeah yeah, brilliant. And uh, yeah, as a side note, anyone listening who wants to become an enterprise advisor, I can highly recommend it. So yeah, get in touch with your local authority because it's definitely worthwhile doing. Um, back to the question, Emrys, I'm going to bring you in because I know we've spoken about this, about this quite a bit before. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I have so many thoughts. I'll try and uh, say them all <laughs> in a sensible <laughs> way. Um, yeah, no, Viv, absolutely. I completely agree that a lot of the time, and this actually... Um, makes disability data really tricky to analyze which is a great challenge um, because it's a porous category people become disabled people become non-disabled and so obviously more people tend to become disabled in sort of particular kinds of ways more commonly as they grow older and so there are you know it's really difficult to tell sometimes what you know what the barriers are and, and what it is that that gets in people's way of having you know equal you know career progression on an equal footing and and so on um i think izzy what you said about um kind of skipping back to the previous question i guess but what you said about sort of the environment of the place like you can't sort of build an office and then put people in and then have it all so nicely like on the sims but it's a sort of you know it has to be uh, that environmental thing. I think that's really important for, um, and that's something that I think I learned through disability, but that then I would want to sort of expand to other marginalized groups. So for example, the social model of disability um, is a really important tool for me. And uh, it says, you know, disability is not something that happens in an individual person and it's you know a defect or a problem or a difference with that person but instead the social model says well people are different and they have their differences um, and those might be experienced as impairments but the disability happens in the interaction with society as a whole and with inaccessible environments with barriers with 
stigma with assumptions and so yeah a part of it is really just that awareness um and then a, another part of it is thinking about the environment and how that is welcoming to or exclusionary of a real diversity of people because nothing will work for everyone there is no like magical way that something will work for everyone i think that's really what inclusion and diversity work as well is really just valuing the diversity of people and understanding that we're not trying to fit you know square pegs in round holes we're trying to kind of make the path more open and more accessible to everybody right um i feel like i probably had something else but it's lost so <laughs> but, oh wait yes no i do um <clears throat> so the royal society of chemistry in in 2018 i think it was the the first sort of big inclusion and diversity thing that we did was um a report called breaking the barriers about women's um retention and progression in academic chemistry um and actually sort of so so again we had that same sort of progression of right okay let's start with gender um but actually um looking at things intersectionally is also really important because often it leads you to sort of um sensible solutions that kind of go across you know it's not that you're sort of looking at each individual minority group and thinking right how do we solve this problem <laughs> um or whatever um but that actually for example the the points that were coming up in the in the breaking the barriers report like flexible working patterns because women are more likely to uh, be responsible for childcare, for example. Well, flexible working patterns that would help me as a as a person with a chronic energy limiting condition, you know. So, these kinds of and a lot of the things that have come up in our recent missing elements report about um, race and ethnicity um, in the chemical sciences. Again, you sort of um, you're seeing, for example, uh, mentors, and it's okay. Well, we want mentors, we want role models. These are things that. Uh, uh you know not limited we don't have to tackle this thing in a sort of like trivial pursuit style like pizza slices like we can kind of think of everything together um and that intersectional analysis is really helpful with that. yeah sorry i spoke oh. so long no I don't, it's, really, it's fine now yeah. is he i'm is gonna he? ask if you've got anything to add yeah just i think what both of you said are right it's kind of all about the knowledge and whether people understand that and know how they can then even use people's disabilities like to an advantage in the company and and like get the best out of their employees that um do have those disadvantages so even i know um gsk at the minute they've done a couple of sessions on like unseen disabilities and um, to try and just get that knowledge out there a little bit more but it's started at a high level at like senior leadership team and i think it's important that we kind of cascade that down because it's not just people in certain positions that um we need to include and we need to make sure we have diversity is there it's kind of all across the board and um, and i think a lot of the time statistics point to oh well women are in ceo positions are going up um, or in managerial but i think we need to work on making it something that's an all round type of thing rather than just doing it for like the top statistics. So yeah, I think it is just about everyone having that knowledge and making it more of a, a round thing rather than everything fits in one category. Yeah. Yeah. Christopher. Um, I want to pick up on um, Emma and she talks about intersectionality. So I think if we so if the question is thinking about gender representation and kind of focusing on that, I, I would suggest, or some research that I did when I was first looking at this, that increasing level of uh, cisgender female representation within an organisation, especially male-dominated organisations, is likely to change a dynamic where um, it creates an environment where empathy and um, less uh there's less conversations that are directive they there's nuance to them there's complexity and it can be based in emotion that's not to say that men are incapable of empathy or emotion but the type of environments that are male dominated usually are hierarchical in terms of transactional and stuff logic so increasing female representation is really 
positive for then creating an environment that is more likely to be inclusive for other groups of people. However, the, the notion of doing that without considering intersectionality creates another problem, which is in, uh, let's say the UK, for instance, if you're in increasing female representation within a male dominated environment, it's likely that you're going to increase white female or majority female representation. So you create an, an able-bodied and um, straight as well. So then you create another issue for yourself where you're not then increasing representation from intersectionality of other minority groups within, um, within the population of women. So I think it's always really important to reflect on the metrics that, companies, that, you, that you are putting in place as a company and what risks you have in doing something. Now, it might be that increasing, focusing on gender is, is great, as I say, for improving the, the level of empathy in an organisation, or it's likely to do that. Um, but yeah, if you are then only focused on bringing in women and you've still got that bias of whiteness, and you're centering your inclusion conversations around whiteness, you're forgetting that actually you have an opportunity to bring in women of colour at the same time, and men of colour, and uh, disabled people and disabled women into the organisation. So I think it's really important that you can't just have a representation metric um, without thinking about um, breaking down those biases, if we're talking about before having that unconscious bias training, really putting some effort into recruitment so that you get, you don't create another problem for yourself down the line when you then want to increase representation of, of another group. Because the biggest barrier that we have within the industry is obviously the, the chain of the talent coming in from universities or from um, local areas into the jobs um, that are available and having the skills and the, the, the um, the experiences that are needed in the industry, but you also have the issue of actually having headcount and roles available to bring somebody in. So if you've already created positions or if you already have brought women into the organisation that happen to be white as well, who would then want to stay with you for 10 to 15 years in the same way that the men in the organisation have stayed with you for 30 years, the, you, the only way that you can bring in other groups of people, other than minority groups, is to either create roles or exit somebody or hope for natural attrition, which then leads us to the problem that we face when we talk about gender in general, that it's going to take us a hundred years until we get true gender parity within society. So I, my, my advice is always, it's, it's great to think about building gender parity in an organisation to start with, it has a real benefit. But you can't do that without reflecting intersectionality because you just create another problem for yourself later down the line. And um, can I ask a really naive question to all of you? And um, as someone who's never been involved in HR processes or hiring processes, what are the steps that, that companies need to take to make sure that they are in a position to hire those people? Because, you know, if it was as easy as just going out and hiring them, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, you know, what steps can companies take to to try and balance that and to, like you said, to try and avoid those kind of transactional um, kind of issues that we face? I don't know. I can uh, yeah, go say on. something uh, first just to yeah. avoid Viv <laughs> and Chris being picked on for this really. <laughs> Just um, to get my little point of first about disability, and again, that I think disability kind of opens on to other things in this instance. So we've got a great um, little series of webinars that I'd love to plug um, <clears throat> on. Uh, uh, that was uh, the Chem Careers um, webinar series of the RSC, uh, collaborated with the Inclusion and Diversity team to talk about disability. And so, um, and in the context of job seeking, so we've got, um, one that is sort of aimed with an audience of employers and so that's titled supporting em disabled employees in the workplace and so there's some really good points in that but i think um part of it and honestly a really big part of it in my own personal experience as well is just when you're looking you know point one your first interaction with you know a job advert or whatever it might be when you're looking at it 
do you see something that says you can speak to us about this question that you have to do with your, you know, your disability in the job or whatever it might be? You can speak to us. We've thought about it. We've thought about, you know, people like you applying and we want people like you to apply. Even just those little kind of inclusion, like a little sentence and those sorts of things, even if it's something like, you know, a, a box on a form to say, if you have any reasonable adjustments that you would need uh, for an interview, for example, that kind of thing says, okay, I've been thought about, and that's really reassuring because it just takes away like a, you know, a little, it takes away one aspect of the fear <laughs> of an interview, I guess. And so, and I think that's, that's quite, you know, telling for other groups as well, that a lot of it, um, you know, yes, there are really important sort of material things that need to be done, but also a lot of it is just sort of showing willing and having that openness and that proactive sort of saying, we're willing to work with you to, to get this right. Oh, Viv, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, it does show your willingness to be um, inclusive by putting things, uh, and, and we should, we, most organisations, do and uh, should put down about reasonable adjustments at interview. Um, the, the problems I, I've seen, so take for instance recruiting an apprentice, um, a degree apprentice. Um, I, I've promoted in our CIA health leadership uh, recently around recruiting a more neurodiverse workforce. We've tapped into neurodiversity and how the environment of a lab um, can be suitable for people with neurodiverse, um, from a neurodiverse background. Um, we've had, for instance, a, a recent autistic assessment from the National Autistic Society to look at this environment and it, it is friendly in terms of, of neurodiverse. Um, so that's been something we've massively changed and massively embraced for us at Stepan. Um, but going back to recruiting uh, an apprentice and then expect the education establishment to follow suit with that, that's been the struggle for us as, as an organisation. We, we might be, uh, yeah, come to us, we'll get you a great degree um, in the lab um, and they've gone to the educational establishment and they're not geared up at all for that disability. So it's then caused problems for that person who's come on board with us because it's mismatched what what we wanted versus what they're actually getting and you know it can make that disability 10 times worse because of those lack of facilities lack of i guess lack of education from an ed educational perspective as well yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, Christopher, I don't know what, what your thoughts are on it about, you know, how you can reach out to different groups. And Yeah, I think um, I've got different wording from what Emma has said. Well, in one of our um, behavioural competencies, uh, one of them is entitled Care and Compassion. And one of the skills that we measure on that is uh, an individual's ability to show they care. And in all of this, I think it's about showing an organisation that we actually do care for people by going the extra mile. Um, I will not sit here and say that Crody is perfect in all of this. We have a lot to do and a lot to learn from. And I think there is something about being authentic and transparent about what we are able to um, do uh, in terms of a career for anyone. Um, but where we also have issues that, and challenges that someone should be aware of, that we even need help to overcome, that we will do something, or um, that it, it may be uh, uncomfortable for a time until we can actually do something across the spectrum of different groups. Um, so for instance, if I talk about um, trans men and women, so our facilities, that we don't have that many sites in the UK that have unisex facilities. So we have to have a conversation about um, bathrooms and comfort level. But, um, our, our transgender representation in the UK is, is, is low, and we do have these conversations on an individual level, which I won't go into because I don't think it's right to do that on this call. But what I will say is, 
it's always about having those conversations about what's reasonable for that individual and showing that you actually do care about them enough to want to do something and retain them and ensure that they feel that we have got their back and we're not just going to say, you know, live with it because it's not right. Where, if we're thinking about where we attract talent from, I think it's really important in the conversations at recruitment, as I was saying, about showing that in the language that we use, in the questions that we ask people, in the way that we approach an individual to, to ensure that they feel um, supported. Also, at the interview stage, I mean, I, I was at a, a recent um, talk in London with some colleagues and we talked about how um, having a male-only panel can be quite intimidating for a woman. Um, or at least in this example, this woman felt that that was going to be the environment that they were going to go into. Um, but the companies that had mixed gendered panels that interview felt a lot more welcoming. So it's even small things like that, being able to see yourself represented in the environment that you might be working in by having representation at interview stage and not doing that you know, purely for tokenism, but saying this is, you know, we're, we're going to create unbiased palette panels by having different people here. I think that's really important to do. Um, I think also if we talk about psychological safety again in the organisation, if you are a disabled person, if you are a transgender person and you start to transition, if you're a woman and you feel intimidated or uncomfortable in the workplace, it's so important for you to be able to say, whether it's your first day or whether it's your uh, 10,000th day in work, that there's a problem and that you need help and support from an organization to be able to change it. So if you're in the chemical industry and if you a chemical graduate and come to the chemical industry and the lab may fit all of the legal requirements, but something's just not quite right for you, you should be able to raise it and feel that you're going to be heard and that something can be done about it. It's the worst thing for an organization to essentially ignore a person or to, to bother them and minimize their problem. And that, again, comes back to those inclusive behaviors. And it's hard to express that externally, but it, it comes through in the way people feel about an organization and talk about it. And I think that goes a long way to retaining and onboarding different groups of people in the first few months. Yeah, no, I think you, you made several important points, but I think, yeah, that, that reporting culture, you know, raising concerns and issues, I think it's, I think it's massive for every aspect of the industry, but certainly um, when we talk about ED and I, you need to feel like you can be safe to speak up. I uh, no, I fully agree. Um, I see we've lost Izzy. Uh, I was going to ask her a chem talent related question, but she's decided to jump off. Um, okay then. So. We've we've spoken a lot about how we can enable an EDI, um, you know, strategy or policy or however we've talked about the the different groups. But I think um, kind of the next question, a positive kind of question, is you know what what are the benefits of having a a diverse workforce? I think if there's anyone listening who thinks you know the profits are up, everything's rosy, but they've not got a very diverse first workforce and they're thinking, you know, why did they need to change? You know, I think you three would be great examples to tell them that there's absolutely a benefit of why they should have a more diverse workforce. So, um, Viv, why don't you start? <laughs> I think it's about a sense of belonging, isn't it? A sense of belonging to know that their contribution matters, um, enables people that enables people to have performed to the best of their own ability you provide that environment, then then people will flourish. It's, it, and also we're down to different range of perspectives, offering a different perspective. Um, and that's what we need more of. Um, and, and also people can recognise customer needs even on the back of that range of perspectives as well, which in turn will help um, the bottom line of the business. Um, so I think for me, it's about that really, 
encourage that, that diverse perspective. Everybody contributes. A sense of belonging. I think if you look at some um, engagement surveys, that's one of the questions that people um, that, that people have to answer is, do you feel a sense of belonging to your business? And, and that's quite important. Yeah. Christopher? So, if there's anybody out there thinking, you know, why, why is this important? What does it do for business? Um, I think there's two angles. We can talk about the business case, and there's plenty of research from our business review, lots of different companies that talk about how diverse teams have greater productivity, have greater innovation, and companies with a broader diverse workforce have better uh, revenue generation. That, that's great. To me, the best reason to have a diverse workforce is one where you're actually able to challenge and ensure that you as an individual are enriching your life with as many different experiences and positive contributions to your information and knowledge as possible. Um, so it feels like a selfish reason, but actually it's one that is so fundamental to the human experience. I think it would be so boring to come to work with very similar people with similar ideas and thoughts every day where you're not challenged about the world, different cultures or different perspectives. So being able to have different people from all different backgrounds, um, different social backgrounds, different um, race and ethnic backgrounds, different sexualities, different incomes, it just adds to your own greater sense of what it means to be and to live. And all of those experiences, when they're channeled through a really inclusive environment, do lead to greater productivity, do lead to better products, do lead to better innovation. And that's also wonderful because when you work for a successful company <laughs> that makes a lot of profit, um, and profit's not all bad when it's being put into the, uh, into the right channels, um, it means that you will also be rewarded and you'll all be rewarded together for the value that you're bringing. And um, I think that's really important for us as well. So we're enriching each other's experiences. And also um, if, we're, if the company that we're working for is working towards improving society and environment and helping to do all sorts of other things, then that, it's great that we can profit in that way together. Yeah, totally agree. Izzy, it's good to have you back. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what happened. I got kicked off the call, but I'm back. <laughs> it's all right. No. Um, so obviously going back to the previous question, you're probably in a similar position to me where, you know, we're not involved in HR or hiring. Um, but I think it kind of it nicely rolls into the question I've just asked about, you know, what are the advantages of having a diverse workforce? So from a from a chem talent perspective, obviously you as chem talent feed into um industry leaders throughout the chemical industry. So, you know, what, you know, from your own experience at GSK, but also with ChemTalent, you know, what do you see as the advantages of having a diverse kind of group and diverse workforce? I think definitely as an apprentice uh, foremost, I see, like, I know that I've like looked at a process and I've seen things that people who have worked there for years haven't seen just because it's a fresh pair of eyes on the situation. Um, and I've, looked up things and found a problem with them that people haven't seen and it's just kind of getting that different perspective in and there's only positive things that can come from that and um, or different things that have been in place for a long time and people just even though they don't find the process easy they'll just go through it because it's the way things have always been done and then someone new comes in like at my age and they're not kind of scared to speak their mind and then it can just make an improvement it can save time it can save energy it can save resources all the things to do with that and um, and then on top of that i think throughout chem talent you see a lot of us have kind of the similar mindset and um, and we all kind of want to do this diversity and equality change and I think that only pushes it more towards happening and once you get more people in even as apprentices or graduates it just kind of sets off a chain reaction as the rest goes on so i think that's definitely 
what kind of chem talent and people in my generation feed into it, just kind of getting the ball rolling. And then you do just time after time see the positive outcomes um, in people's work and, and in the process. Emrys? Yeah, I think everyone's pretty much said it all, really, in terms of the the meat of it. I guess I've just got sort of, yeah, support for everything everyone said in our... Um, the RIC did a, a study on sense of belonging in chemistry um, in 2020 and I think so. And um, time feels so fake these days. Um, but yeah, I know that found, you know, there are these really tangible benefits when people feel that a sense of belonging um, and there are various elements to kind of creating those cultures of belonging, but diversity is a big you know, catalyst for that. Um, and then productivity is higher, well-being is higher, you know, collaboration and people, I think one of the best examples somebody sort of said from our focus groups is, you know, it's just the question of, you know, not just are you at the table, do you have a seat at the table, but when you're at the table and you see something that you feel like, as you said, you know, you see something that might be a problem or even just you kind of have a question it's do you feel like you can say that or do you feel like you're going to be sort of, you know, that it's going to be perceived as a silly question. Um, and if you feel able to kind of speak up in those ways, yeah, that can create, you know, massive change that people just didn't anticipate um, because they didn't, yeah, have that that other perspective on things. Yeah. No, oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, going back to something you said, Christopher, I think it's, um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I work in a, in a fairly big organization and I moved from our manufacturing hub where it was kind of like you can imagine you kind of the, the typical demographic in our industry in the UK. Um, and then I moved into our kind of global research where it was, you know, we have bases in China, India, Saudi Arabia, America, lots of different age ranges. Um, and I learned more from engaging with them on a kind of on a soft skill side, you know, their approach to learning, um, just that cultural learning that you kind of that I've been fortunate enough to do with my role. But you're right, it's so it's empowering, I think um, it's probably the best way to describe it. It's, um, you know, I find it staggering when I've had, you know, interviews in the past where people say you know well do you mind working with different cultures it's kind of like well it's, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer because it's something that i've done now for forever and you know i wouldn't have it any other way now um yeah um okay so i think kind of we're, we're getting towards the end and i just i think um do you mind if i just please yeah that? please sorry I, um you sparked a, a thought in my head which i think i think does warrant saying that actually there, are, there is some evidence, uh, conclusive evidence, that also shows that diversity in certain teams can be problematic. So <laughs> HR, from a certain aspect, you have to think about whether or not disruption is good. Diversity in teams creates innovation through a challenge and disruption, and it's an amazing thing. That's how you truly innovate. You have a transactional-based team that has a set specific um, tasks to do, too much disruption, wherever that comes from in terms of thinking of new ways to do it, can slow your processes down. So when you talked about the manufacturing side, um, there's always a balance between increasing representation and, and um, different levels of diversity, but do you really want to create a situation where there's lots of diversity of thought on your processes that can um, can bring some changes and some efficiencies and, and show where the things might be not great. But if that's constantly happening, how, how do you address it in a way that's not to diminish the contributions of the, of the people that are talking about it? Um, and that goes for if you've got a whole wide male workforce, you might have some extroverts and some introverts, and you might have some people that have some ideas about what you're doing, some beliefs about some other things. Um, so it's not to talk about diversity disrupting, it's more mm. when, you, when you have that group where you just need a team to perform, you also have to think about that and how it can be disrupted. Yeah. Um, I thought it'd be useful to throw that in just in case there's anyone watching this that thinks, yeah, let's just bring it <laughs> in. Super different people. It 
can, can lead to inefficiencies in certain teams. Yeah. Yeah, no, I fully agree. And I think as well, you've, you've kind of pricked my brain. I don't want anyone listening who I used to work with in manufacturing to think he thinks that we don't work hard because that's not the case at all. I had so much fun and learned so much when I worked in manufacturing. But I think for me, the, the biggest learning in, you know, an R&D world where I was kind of innovating and working on novel chemistry wasn't actually the chemistry. It was that cultural difference that I got from working, you know, having spent six years working in manufacturing sites on Teesside to joining a kind of global organization. Um, but yeah, no, completely agree. Um, okay, so then the, the last question I have for, for all of you is kind of what for any, you know, anyone listening or watching who employs people or, you know, is in HR who manages people, you know, what support is, is out there? for employers or people to get when they talk about, you know, inclusion or, you know, making sure that no one's left out. Um, Emrys, I'm going to start with you because I know the Royal Society of Chemistry have done lots of brilliant work. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to list everything because I will <laughs> worry that I would miss things up. But yeah, I mean, basically, you know, the Royal Society of Chemistry is a learning society for all chemists. Um, often, I think maybe there's an assumption that um, we tend towards the academic. Um, I don't think that's true. I think sometimes it's easier to engage in, you know, places that are kind of more clearly in a, a particular structure and I could be, and where we have a lot more data from and academia is one of those. Um, but industry often, you know, has, I think, you know, often some of, I think some of, often the best practice comes from an industry already. So it's not that I'm, you know, even implying that there's some difference there. I think we all need to connect up more and we all need to learn from each other. That's a really key part of the RSC inclusion and diversity strategy is that collaboration, that sharing of knowledge and of, um, of good practice. And so, um, yeah, I just really encourage um, anyone to <laughs> kind of get in touch um, with the RSC and yeah, to have a look through the resources that we have. I've already plugged those. Um, job seeking and disability webinars. Um, we've got um, a video on unconscious bias or what we actually started calling um, implicit bias because we sort of said, okay, well, once it's been made conscious, then what? Um, and, um, you know, it doesn't just disappear at that point. Like we have to work and we have to make sure when we're making decisions that we kind of force ourselves to pause, right? Um, like that's that's a part of it. Um, we've got the, as well, the um, kind of a couple of different helplines as well for individuals. Um, there's a bullying and harassment support line that came out of the Breaking the Barriers report. So that um, exists, but in terms of the more organisational, um, we've got our LGBT plus toolkit, which has a booklet that's aimed at employers and managers. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, the, the missing elements report and the kind of things that have come off the back of that in terms of race and ethnicity, there's really useful resources there and some kind of programs that um, would be um, good to kind of, you know, link up with and, and learn from. And we'll have more kind of evidence coming out of those soon about what works. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I, I said I wasn't going to list things, when I did. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure there's a million other things, but yeah, no, definitely, I've really encouraged me to get, to get in touch with the RSC, for sure. Yeah. That'll be great. Um, and, and Viv, um, anything specific that, that you've done at Stepan or any resources that you've used that have helped? <laughs> well, I would use, obviously, access to work if people have uh, need support in work. I would consult ACAS, CIPD. Uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, I think. I think overall, being the oldest person on the panel, I think <laughs> from an older person's view, and I am classed as an older person now, being over fifty. Um, it's keeping up, keeping up with language, keeping up with change is probably the most difficult thing that I have to educate the workforce on. Keeping up myself on top of that as well. So I probably would say to people watching, you know, don't diss the older generation because they probably don't know what to say and they're scared of what to say sometimes. So that's quite, 
quite a big thing, I would say. But, you know, I, try, I, I am trying to educate that older generation about um, uh, the whole equality, diversity, inclusion piece. I think it's getting a lot better. And as I think Christopher alluded to, we're not there yet and we're far from it completely. Um, so I'd like to leave it there, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you. Um, Christopher, any resources you've used at Corona? Um, actually, the RSC reports are really good for looking at, um, well, it, depend, depending on how nerdy you want to get with data, it's really good to look at. Um, there was an RSC report about the different groups of people leaving universities in uh, physical science subjects how that then maps out into your recruitment. Um, so you can see if there's a drop off. I think the report was a few years ago, but it showed that 11% of graduates um, in chemistry um, identified having a, as being disabled. So 11%, then you would hope that that moves into your workforce and you know numbers are a lot lower than that. So it, it gives you an indication of where your talent can come from and if you're missing the mark on attracting that talent. So that's it's always good to look at those reports and use them as a sense check. I'd say, you know, some of the biggest support and, and following on from what Biff said can come from your own employees' knowledge and their own passion about certain topics. And just allowing affinity groups or employee resource groups to come together on a topic, whether it's about race, whether it's about belief, whether it's LGBTQ, whether it's a group around specific disabilities, that group with purpose and an action driven um, mentality will help the workforce move forward. They may feel frustrated at times that it doesn't move forward as quickly as, as they want, but it's absolutely key to that understanding and helping an employer really understand what the lived experience is like. If you're, if you're looking for tools, there are many companies out there that specialize in training and learning packages. So obviously talking to your HR teams about what's available is, is a great thing, but there are so many companies that can provide an hour, two hours, 12 days worth of content, you know, face-to-face -face or online training that can really help us create discussions. Um, we use a company called Involve, um, who do like work or inclusive employers, or, or another one. Um, but there, there's so many different companies out there. Um, they're just two off the top of my head that we've worked with in the last two weeks that we're setting stuff up with. But I think it's always important to reflect back what does the organisation feel it needs to do? What are the barriers and how are you going to overcome them? Um, because like I said before, it can be very overwhelming to look at the broad spectrum of what it means to be a diverse company. Um, and it's not one size fits all. So you have to really think about what's the problem today and what's the step forward. And, and don't forget that an inclusive organisation is one where people can speak up, where there's empathy, where there's true care. And those soft skills and things that come from, again, training and development, but also just having leaders and managers help um, provide safe spaces for people to have good conversations. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then finally, Izzy, I don't know if you know kind of the, the HR stuff of what GSK have been doing, but I think from a chem talent perspective, it might be nice to hear, you know, what, what you've got planned for ED&I and, and anyone who's listening who maybe wants to get involved with chem talent, please, by all means, plug away. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd just like to first say I like what Viv was saying kind of about the old generation needing to keep up with kind of all of the new lingo and what's going on. And I think the easiest thing to say is is for that older generation to ask the young people in your company. You don't even need to be 
want to go anywhere far with it but as long as you know understand what challenges they're facing understand what they want to see with diversity and inclusion and then you can kind of change your way of working and change that culture and um, in chem talent we recently done an ed and i report which was which was quite amazing looking back at it and looking at the challenges people our age face and i think probably the older generation don't realize that quite as much um, and we're looking on just kind of spreading that up right to the top high level of leaders and seeing how we can cascade that down through every company possible to kind of get that culture shift in place and just really make everyone a lot more knowledgeable about what needs to be put in place because I know a lot of the stuff that I've heard on the call today it's stuff that wouldn't even cross my mind and it's not because I don't want to know about it and because I'm ignorant it's because it's just something that's not talked about enough and I think this panel's kind of done what we wanted it to do and kind of kickstart that conversation and yeah chem talent over the next year we want to kind of push that and see where we can take it to create a positive change. Need I say more? I think uh, it's a great place to finish, right on the hour mark as well. Um, no, all of you, I just want to take this moment to thank you all for, for coming on this panel. And um, yeah, I just second what Izzy said, you know, I've had my eyes opened. And, and like you say, it's not through ignorance. It's just that, you know, we're, we're not aware of these kind of different things and initiatives. And um, yeah, I think if we can certainly as part of can talent start to to make a change at the top and we can do what we do with um early careerists and hopefully we'll meet somewhere in the middle with uh, some impactful changes so um yeah no hey i just want to thank all of you again for for coming on to the the webinar and um yeah i'm sure, I'm sure we'll, we'll speak, speak in the future thank you for sharing thank no you for inviting us <laughs> thank you thanks all thank you.